you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, can you hear me OK in the back? Yes, OK, excellent. I'm so glad you're here today, and you've come up to Experience Lake Observatory. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the supernova research that's happening up here that I've been involved in. So what you're looking at right now is a GIF of a supernova exploding in a galaxy. This was made by Julian Gee, just to sort of uh, give you an idea. So it's a, this is two months, that loop. So you're seeing two months in a short amount of time about a supernova exploding in a galaxy. So galaxies are billions of stars. And this supernova is one single star that's exploding. And I like this gift because it demonstrates that the one single exploding star gets actually brighter than the combined sum of a billion stars uh, in the host galaxy. So uh, it's a good demo. One more person. I, I already have a seat. I just have a <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> that's fine. Um, so I pre I've prepared a talk that's a bit compartmentalized. So since we're running a bit behind, I'm going to chop a little bit of it out because I want you to feel free to ask questions during the talk at any time. So I basically mentally prepared for 10 minutes of time for questions. It can be at the end or it can be during the talk. Both are, both are going to be fine. So please feel welcome to ask. Um, I'm from Canada, so I started my career at Queen's University up in Kingston, Ontario, and then I moved over to the University of Victoria for my PhD. After that, I moved down to uh, UC Santa Barbara. I was a postdoctoral fellow there for three years before moving up to UC Berkeley, where I am now. So I've been in the UC system for five years, which means I've had access to uh, this uh, observatory for five years, and I've been using it for about that long. Um, if this is your first time up, welcome. Here's just a, a um, a kind of a picture of the hill to show you uh, the different kinds of telescopes I'll be talking about. The biggest dome is the Shane 3 meter. And in the background, we have the Katzman Automated Imaging Telescope, which is rather small. Um, in, right in the middle, we have the Automated Planet Finder Telescope. And then in the front is the building that we are in right now with the Great Refractor at one end and the nickel at the other, both of which you're going to get to see after this talk. Um, so since I've been coming up for five years and telescopes are so beautiful, I've taken a lot of pictures, just kind of wanted to give you uh, a little view of the inside of some of the domes in advance of what you're going to be seeing. The Great Refractor is over on your left and at the top. In the middle is me with um, the Shane 3 meter, which is also over on the right. If you go underneath the Great Refractor, you see the tomb of James Lick, which is down there. I don't know that, do they go? They, you do not go down there tonight. Okay. <laughs> There's, I think, far too many of you. It's a very small space. You can see the ceiling's only about this high, so it's a little dangerous. But um, he is buried down there. The nickel at the bottom and up at the top right is the, uh, in the user interface for a very old instrument that I used to use all the time called the Gemini infrared camera that is no longer in service. Um, because it was quite old and it, we just used it to death. Um, so I've been up here in all kinds of weather. You've heard a lot about snow. It does snow every year up here at Lick Observatory, but we also have luckily lots of beautiful weather uh, as well, which let, allows us to take a lot of data. So let's start our the astronomy section with uh, right here, right in the skies above you, what you would see. If you went out tonight, you would see um, it's the summer, so you would see the Milky Way, which is our own home galaxy. You'd see lots of stars in the sky. Um, these are two pictures I just took off the internet. Um, I think that they're both sort of color scaled to be a little bit extra blue. I don't think the, the sky is actually that blue. So let's use the Hubble Space Telescope instead and take a closer look at the stars in our galaxy. All right, so the first thing you notice right away is that stars come in different colors, blue ones, red ones. The blue stars are hotter and the red stars are cool. And this is a, a temperature. Thing. Blue stars are hotter. Um, stars are also, some are brighter, some are fainter. Sometimes this is because they're further away from you, they'll be fainter. But also, um, brighter stars have a larger radius. So it's all about how many photons can get through the surface of that star. It will make them brighter. If they're bigger, they can release more energy, basically, through their surface. The hotter, larger stars are also more massive. And we know this. Um, Stars, what causes them to shine is that they fuse hydrogen into heavier elements. So this is what we call burning, but it's actually a chemical reaction inside the star. So that fusion allows them to shine because that um, releases energy. 
And it's a very important thing to note about stars because that's what keeps them in what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. So the energy that's produced by that fusion pushes out and counteracts the gravity that would normally want to pull material together. So that burning is what's keeping the star from collapsing. So it basically has to burn to survive. That's the energy that it's consuming to stay up as a star. This cannot continue forever. So that nuclear burning is eventually going to get you into a state, if you're a massive star, if you're massive enough that your inside layers are hot enough to burn to heavier and heavier elements, you will eventually end up with this onion-like structure where you have um, hydrogen and helium, the lighter elements on the outside, proceeding to the heavier ones uh, on the inside. And so unfortunately, burning iron is not exothermic. That means it doesn't release energy. So it's not gonna naturally happen inside a star like the burning of the other elements. So what you have in this situation is a core that can no longer burn when it's iron. It doesn't have any way to support itself. Because if you're not burning, you don't have the hydrostatic equilibrium we just talked about. So you're gonna collapse if you um, have an iron core. So that loss of hydrostatic equilibrium leads to core collapse which leads to a supernova. So this kind of scenario with the massive star having a core collapse, that's the most common kind of supernova that we see in the universe. All massive stars will end their life in this way. And by massive, I mean more massive than eight times the mass of the sun. So quite a bit, a bit bigger. So that's actually not the kind of supernovae that I study. Um, if your star is in the two to eight times the mass of the sun range, you don't actually get all the way to iron in the core. Um, it's the star is not big enough. It doesn't have the internal pressures and the heating required to burn all the way to iron. So you would end up something with more like a magnesium, neon, or maybe a carbon core instead. And cores like that, they also can't burn forever. They will eventually not be able to fuse anymore because they're not hot enough but they don't actually collapse because they can support themselves by something called electron degeneracy pressure. So in place of that radiation that was coming from the burning to keep the star up, you instead have um, this pressure that's caused basically by saying no two things can occupy the same space. That's kind of all this electron degeneracy pressure is saying. Um, so they're quite happy to cool and they will collapse and your star can become the same size as the Earth, but as massive as the Sun. So that's what we're talking about when we say a white dwarf star. They're very small, uh, but they're still very massive. And those white dwarf stars will live happily ever after, unless, unless it has a companion star that's there kind of messing up its happy ever after story. Um, especially if that companion star is, I, a red giant star or even a sun-like star that starts transferring some of its mass uh, onto the white dwarf star or it could be another white dwarf star but over a very long period of time due to gravitational radiation or maybe just perturbation from a third star they will eventually merge or one white dwarf might accrete the other so a white dwarf by itself will be perfectly happy a white dwarf with a companion star um, things can get, get a little bit crazy. So a carbon oxygen white dwarf, as it turns out, is not stable all the time. If it approaches 1.4 solar masses, that's when that electron degeneracy pressure can no longer keep up the mass of the star. So it's too massive to be supported by electron degeneracy pressure. And you will get a massive thermonuclear detonation. So this is the entire star just can't support itself anymore. And basically it reaches a critical mass and it goes off like an atomic bomb. It's very similar physics that are happening in there. And we call that a type 1a supernova for ancient nomenclature reasons. But um, for the purposes of this talk, if I ever say supernova 1a or type 1a supernova, I mean an exploding white dwarf star that has exploded in this way. So. All right, these poor little things. Um, <laughs> but it's actually really useful to have an object in the universe that you know every time you see one, it's a 1.4 solar mass white dwarf converting all of its mass into energy. So E equals mc squared, the famous thing from Einstein. These are identical events every single time. They always release 10 to the 51 ergs of energy where erg is it's like a jewel, but different. Astronomers use it. We have lots of funny <laughs> units that we like to use. Um, and so 
This is very important because identical events can be used as what we call standard candles. So the only reason one type 1a supernova would be any fainter than another one is because it's further away, because they're all actually identical if you are uh, up close in person. And so we can use them as distance indicators in the universe, and this is very useful for cosmology, which, as you may have heard, um, type 1a supernova as distance indicators were used to show that our uh, universe's expansion is accelerating and that won the Nobel Prize and there's the team there getting their Nobel Prize and it was people from Berkeley as well as around the world that were on these teams. So that was all very exciting. I'm not going to talk about cosmology actually much at all tonight. You can ask me about it at a question time if you want to. But there's so many problems that remain. We're using these things as distance indicators but we don't actually know specifically how they explode exactly yet. We don't know um, what is the common mass transfer mechanism. We don't know what's the usual binary star companion. All of these things might affect the events in ways that we don't quite understand and that can affect all of cosmology from there. So um, there's a lot of us right now that are working to try and understand these type 1a supernovae physically, what is happening when they explode, what was that companion star like, how much mass was transferred, um, if you have other metals in the star, so I said they're mostly carbon and oxygen white dwarf, but you, can, you have the trace amounts of iron in there, um, magnesium, all kinds of other things. How does that affect your explosion? All of these things we want to find out. So. If we want to study these type 1a supernovae, first we have to find them. Now that's the thing. So we need to survey. And that's being done right here on this mountain with the Katzmann Automated Imaging Telescope. That was the little tiny dome that was off in the background. And it was one of the first robotic supernova surveys. So if you want to find a lot of supernovae, you've got to be taking images of the sky night after night after night. And it's very time intensive um, for astronomers to do that kind of work. And so if you can set up a telescope to run as a robot and just scan the sky and take the pictures, and for you, then that's the way to go. So this um, project was one of the first to try that. It's found hundreds of supernovae and produced some of really amazing results uh, over time. And it covers a wide uh, region of the sky. So some surveys will look just along one path in the sky. So they'll just point at one tiny patch, but they'll observe it really, really well. So they'll be able to see things that are really, really faint in that tiny patch, which means that they can go deeper into the universe with that kind of uh, survey and see things really far away. Um, that's useful for some things, especially if you want to do cosmology and find things further away. But if you want to study something in great detail, you want to find as many as you can as close as you can so that they're even brighter. And so to get a large volume that's really nearby, you have to cover a wide area of sky. So your survey has to be fast and it has to be working every night. And that's what Kate does. So it's been awesome. To give you a little sense of what it's like to be a supernova hunter, we're going to play a little game and <laughs> we're going to see if you can find the supernova. So I'm going to blink between two images and uh, you're going to do what I do sometimes. So You can tell, like, tell the person sitting next to you and you can pine point it out and then you can, we'll see if you're right. So these two images are pretty different because um, one's much better quality than the other. but. Okay, would someone like to come and point it out? I think we don't have any kids here tonight. Usually kids like want to run up and point it out, but um, I also don't have a laser pointer. But it's right above the nucleus of the host galaxy. So it's really, really close to the center and, and right above the nucleus. And if you didn't see it before, hopefully you see it now. Yes, one question. How much time was it between the two photos? Um, between these two, is only a couple weeks. I think it's um, October 10 to October 29. Um, this actually was not, so, uh, I'm cheating a little here, these weren't images even taken for a survey. So the second image is follow up once we knew the supernova was there. And then I happened to be looking back in the data and I realized that this particular telescope had randomly imaged this galaxy a couple weeks before. So it, it's perfect because it makes great uh, demo for this. Um, but typically, if you do want to survey for supernovae, you want to look at a three to seven day time scale kind of thing because they will last for about a month. And so um, you want a good couple of points on your light curve. You want to know um, how fast it was rising and that kind of thing. Yes, computers can do this. Um, 
Now, I don't really have any demos of that either, but basically you take two images and your computer programs can align the images. They can account for any changes in the background, any changes in the star blurring between the two images, subtract them, and then you can run a source finder on your difference image and pull out all the stuff that uh, you want. So we love it. Like, please, computers, do our jobs <laughs> for us or write more papers. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so that's, so that's what it's like to be a supernova hunter. Um, since supernovae are exploding stars, we find them where the stars are, and that is in galaxies. So here's a beautiful picture of two of our neighbor galaxies, M81 and 82. The Andromeda uh, on the left, it's our nearest, biggest neighbor, and it's the biggest galaxy in the local group, actually, also. And the Cigar Galaxy, named for its elongated shape um, over there. So those are beautiful. Um, Supernova 2014J was discovered in M82 on January 21st, 2014. This is a very unique discovery because uh, Stephen Fossey is a professor at the University of London Observatory and he says the weather was closing in with increasing cloud. So instead of the planned practical astronomy class, I gave the students an introductory demonstration of how to use the CCD uh, camera on one of our observatory's automated telescopes. So even though it was an automated telescope, it was a bunch of students sitting in a room for a class who went, hey, that galaxy looks different than it looked the last time we looked at it. And so almost never are, are supernovae found by eye anymore, like I was telling you. They're usually found by surveys, but this one was found by eye. Um, and it was found in England, which um, is usually pretty cloudy and pretty rainy, so they were kind of lucky that they found this one, and it was very close and nearby. So there's a picture of one of the students recording their observations for the night. You can see the cigar galaxy up on the... On the I think it's playing the thing that I skipped, maybe. No? Is that just me? Okay. I skipped, a, I skipped a little movie that plays music and stuff. So here's the, the beautiful view. So this is the HST and Spitzer image in the background with, um, with 2014J on the front. Oh, and J, so 20, year 2014, it was the Jace supernova discovered in 2014. So whatever, is that the 11th, something like that, uh, in the year. A very creative naming system. Uh, so I remember where I was in the early evening of January 21st when the emails started coming in that there's been a supernova in M82. It's really rare because it's so close. Um, that's the night before my birthday. So uh, I was just chilling at home on Facebook, basically planning my day for tomorrow when it came in. And... I knew I had seen my friend BJ Fulton post on Facebook that he was just getting ready to observe with the automated planet finder telescope that night. So BJ works on exoplanets, which is what the APF is designed to do. Um, but I said, oh, BJ, there's just been this supernova. It's bright enough to do with the APF, which is very rare. So it's only because it was so close that we could take uh, spectra of this one with the APF. And I said, can you take a spectrum of it for me? And I think he probably would have, even if I hadn't asked, because he's a really clever guy like that, but he did. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about that data in a little bit. Right, I'm going to talk about it right away. Never mind. Um, <laughs> I kind of moved some things around. Uh, so this is what it looks like when you take a spectrum with the APF. What is even happening here? Okay, we're going to need some physics to interpret this data. So I'm going to have to teach you a couple things about spectra and how they're made, and then we can all understand what it is that I've done with this data. Okay, so let's start with the wave particle duality of light. So this is a wave, a ripple, right, uh, on water, which I think we're all pretty familiar with. Um, but uh, light is photons, and so if you think of them as a, a particle, you're thinking of it as a photon, but it also behaves as a wave. All right, so you have waves, you have different wavelengths, and that's what gives you the different colors. So uh, shorter wavelengths are the bluer, and longer wavelengths create redder light. So that's how your eye interprets the color. Photon comes in and it hits it, and your brain's like, oh, I know what wavelength that was. Not exactly how that works, but um, pretty close. And then it interprets it as color. And so um, our cameras can do the same thing, uh, basically. So going back to this wave idea, so we have a source, supernova, a star, something in the middle, and it's letting out these waves of photons. And we, we observe it with our telescope over there. And there we go, that's one wavelength. But what if your source is moving um, one way or the other? So this is a Doppler effect that you may already be familiar with that I'm about to explain. Um, if your source is moving in between images, so you can think of it as it's emitting a wave, 
uh, at certain times. And if it moves in between emitting that wave, the ones in the direction in which it's moving will have less time between them because it moves a little bit and then emits again, and then moves a little bit and emits again. So those crests are closer together. And on the other side, they're farther apart because your object's been moved. So it's the same thing as when a siren goes past you, right, on the highway or whatever. It sounds uh, higher when it's coming towards you and lower when it's re receding. And so that's the same as saying objects that are moving towards you or you towards it because it's relativistic. So it goes, um, well, it's relativity, so it's relative. God, all those words mean slightly different things. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's relative, and so if you're moving towards the source as well, if you were running really fast at a siren that was standing still, you would also hear it blue shifted. So um, just the important thing to remember here, things that are moving towards the observer, bluer wavelengths, things that are moving away, longer wavelengths, which is redder. Okay, so we also need to learn a little bit about spectroscopy to understand uh, the data. So what we do, typically you can think of it as diffracting the light into separate wavelengths, projecting the rainbow onto a camera and taking a picture of the rainbow. This is really all we're doing with spectroscopy. Um, so for example, when you have what we call continuum emission, such as we see from the sun, if you maybe have a prism at your house hanging in a window, you'll see photons at all wavelengths. So you would see kind of what the bottom one uh, is showing you right there. So Electrons, maybe you've heard of quantum theory, probably. All quantum means is discretized or packets or units of energy. So um, an electron that's orbiting the nucleus of an atom can't have any random energy. It's, um, only ha it can have very certain ones. So it only occupies certain energy levels uh, around the nucleus. And so when a photon comes in, if it's got exactly the right amount of energy or has exactly the right wavelength, you can say either things, the electron can jump into a higher orbit. So basically absorbs that particular photon of light because it has the right amount of energy to get it just into the next level, no more, no less. That's what, that's what quantum uh, means. And so in that case, if you've got continuum emission like the sun <clears throat> with stuff in front of it, that has electrons that are going up into different states, you will get these dark bands. So, right, they're only absorbing at very specific wavelengths of light, and then you see dark bands in your spectrum. So only that one very specific color. So for example, you've got calcium lines in the blue, sodium lines in the yellow, uh, and hydrogen and oxygen lines up here in the red, just because of how their nucleus and their electron energy levels are made. Um, so, to say this again, right, continuum emission, if you have a dust cloud in the way, so the previous one I showed you, all of these elements are the, in the atmosphere of the sun, but they don't have to be like right next to the object that's doing the emitting. They can be just anywhere along the path between um, the observer and the source. And so in this case, you'll see dark bands on your spectrum. Putting this together with the Doppler effect that we just learned about, if your absorbing material is moving towards you, you will see shifts in the lines because of the Doppler effect. Moving towards you uh, means shifting to bluer wavelengths. So you can see those little lines will shift in your spectrum when the absorbing material is moving towards you. All right. That pretty much concludes our really hard physics lesson for today. <laughs> and you are welcome to ask questions now or maybe ask a question of your neighbor really quietly if you, if you want to um, before we move on to looking at the data. Yeah, question. So um, because of the wavelength, we could see which chemicals are actually computing on? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And not only stars, but supernovae or the material that might be around them. Yeah, exactly. Anyone else? Okay. So a spectrum can tell us about the composition, the amount, right, from the depth of the absorption line, and also the velocity of any material along the line of sight between you and an emitting source. So I've been showing you mostly spectra, like the bottom, but that's not actually how we deal with the data, as um, how we usually deal with it in the graphical sense. So on top, what you're seeing is the intensity of light at a, at a given wavelength as a function of wavelength. So wherever there's a dark band where the light is being absorbed at that wavelength, you see a dip in the spectrum. So you see the absorption lines 
um, also in the graphical one. And so from here on out, we're mostly going to work with the graphical version. So I wanted to show this to compare. Oh, and behind you, you're actually seeing a very high resolution spectrum of the sun. Um, not behind you, but behind the, the in the background up here um, of so the in sun. The graph, yeah. Uh, that's a particular type of, uh, you know, that's like whatever you're saying, the element is there. You can tell what's in the way just by how fast those lines are going. Yeah, so this I think is a spectrum of a really normal standard star. And. Actually, not totally sure what's making all of those lines because I don't think it's the hydrogen sequence exactly. Um, some of it is hydrogen for sure, but yes, yes. Um, so, so now we're switching to the graphical version. This, um, these are two spectra of supernova 2014J taken with the CAST spectrograph that's on the Shane three meter telescope right here at Lick Observatory. And so you can see right away that some of these lines are massively broad, much broader than the ones I was just showing you. And that's because when you have a supernova exploding, the material is extremely, extremely hot. Hot means the motion of the individual particles is really fast. Uh, so that's all that temperature is. It's actually the motion of the particles, how fast they move around. So you have a hot thing, you have all those particles moving around really, really fast, and it's going to smear out your lines. So each one has its own little velocity, um, and that's going to cause, so if you could measure from each individual atom that did some absorbing, you might have lots and lots of tiny little lines, but you add it all up together and you end up with very, very broad lines. So this is what supernova spectra look like because they're very hot exploding material, except that you might say, okay, well, what are these extremely thin lines on top of the supernova spectrum? That stuff, now that we've just learned that temperature also causes line width, must be a lot cooler, um, these very narrow lines. And it is, so this is um, intervening cool gas between us and the supernova. So, <laughs> We all got very excited when we saw this for a type 1a supernova, that there's material between us and it uh, for a reason. And that is that the main progenitor scenarios that I was telling you about before, whether the different kinds of companions make different predictions for the um, kind of circumstellar material in the system. And by circumstellar material, I mean just stuff that has come off of the stars and still resides um, around the stars. So for example, in the case where you have mass accretion from a red giant, that red giant is losing lots of material. Some of it makes its way onto the white dwarf, but not all of it. So you're gonna have hydrogen and all kinds of dust and gas left over in the system. Whereas, as you can see in the two white dwarf scenario, if they merge together, all of that material is consumed in the explosion and you don't have any lingering material left around. So by figuring out how much circumstellar material there was in your supernova, you can kind of link that back to the kinds of stars that were doing the exploding. And that's what this game is all about. And that's what the bottom graph is saying as well. It's just linking between progenitor scenario and how much stuff you see around it. So, all right. So we see these narrow lines, um, but M82 actually just has lots of stuff in it anyway. Um, as you saw before in those other images, it looked like a mess, right? There was beautiful Andromeda with its spiral arms, and then there was this mess next to it with all this dust and gas um, in there. So um, we're gonna have to figure out what belongs to the galaxy and what might belong to the star system that did the exploding. But, so now I'm gonna show you what happens when we use the automated planet finder telescope on a spectrum instead of cast. So this is, prepare yourself, this is crazy, okay. So, <laughs> all right, we just zoomed in on that extremely narrow spectral feature. And now what you're seeing is, first of all, sodium is actually two individual lines that are usually blended together. And as you can see, so this is flux versus wavelength again. And at some points it goes down to zero. There's no flux getting through at all because there's so much sodium on your line of sight. So you got the two main lines. And as we learned before, the sort of zero velocity is marked by the thick lines up at the top where it says um, Na1D next to it. That means sodium one, we call it the D line just by convention. 
And every little individual line that you see is material with its own velocity moving um, with respect to us and with respect to the supernova that's exploding. And so this is basically unprecedented. No one's been able to examine the material along the line of sight to a supernova in quite this level of detail before. Okay, most of the spectra we get look a lot more like that top one than like this bottom one. So we see sodium absorption in the APS spectrum. Great. So what was most interesting about this were all the different colors. I don't know if in the back you can see very well, but this is actually 11 or 12 epics of data, which is sort of just, it's just days, 12 days of data plotted on top of each other. Okay, so every color is a different date. They're like two or three days apart and they kind of span over about a month. So what we notice is that it's exactly the same every time. Okay, if there was circumstellar material in the system, it would be so close to that supernova explosion that it would be affected by it. So over time, as we're watching, we would see maybe some of these lines disappear, maybe some of them get deeper as that material is impacted by the ejecta from the supernova. But we don't see that at all for, for this particular one. Even with this high resolution and this amazing of data, it looks the same all the time. All right, so we said, okay, so if nothing is changing uh, in these spectral features over time, maybe it's not circumstellar material. Maybe it's just all ISM material, gas clouds in the galaxy that happen to be moving towards us. Um, that's fine. We see that as well all the time. Do you, proto question? Right. No. no. There's oh, there's a fly. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I saw this and I thought, well, that's nice, but uh, kind of boring. Yeah, yeah. There, there is some, at the very top up there, there is some lines that don't match. Ah. Little, uh, yeah, are you talking about the little features that go up? Yeah. Yeah, um, right, kind of, can I? Well, yeah, no, okay. but like there, yeah. but at the top? Yes, yeah, so that, um, what you're not seeing in this is that the night sky okay. emits um, sodium emission line features that have been subtracted. Uh, so if we looked at this um, maybe in raw data, you would see giant lines that went up so that because it's emitting light instead of absorbing. So it's been subtracted and then leaves a little bit of residual. Yeah, so it's more those lines kind of tell us how good our data is. It's kind of like a measure of uncertainty, but uh, yeah, I'm not a worry. Um, the same gravity. So you mark the two spots in a ID one and two, mm -hmm. and then I see the drawing. <coughs> Areas down below, and there's a shift, it's like one three thousandth of the wavelength. Does that indicate that it's traveling at one three thousandth of the speed of light? Um, if the conversion almost goes like that, yeah. Okay, so you're asking what are the velocity, like what are the actual. Yeah, so. Um, so material at zero velocity with respect to the supernova would be right where the broad line, or the, the dash line is up there. And so, for example, these lines over here, the relative velocity is about 140 kilometers per second. Yeah, so the, um, all of these are at individual velocities, but the, the biggest one goes up to about 140 kilometers per second. So that's the kind of sensitivity that we're getting. Oh, so here, that's actually um, saturation. So it's just that um, whatever material this is, it's not letting any photons through. There's so much sodium that it just eats them all right up. How narrow would it normally be? How narrow would it normally be? So similar to so the ones that are not saturated, that's like a natural line width. So that would represent the natural temperature of um, the absorbing material. So the natural temperature of gas. So that because they're so thin, it's quite cold because it's just floating out in the galaxy. Yeah. Um, more questions? Okay, so sodium, no evolution that we see in any of the features. So I kind of sat on this for a while and it's like, I don't know if it's really interesting. It's really pretty data, so I should try to publish it. But then I started looking at the other lines in the spectrum, in particular, the lines that potassium makes. So in this plot, you're seeing something very similar to what you saw before. The zero velocity, I've put um, a nicer, thick line right there. Up at the top, I've overplotted in velocity space the sodium line that we were just looking at. So physically, all of the features um, that line up 
or the same physical material because they're moving at the same velocities. So you can see the potassium is not saturated at all. It just doesn't do as good a job at absorbing the material, uh, absorbing the photons. And so I was looking at this and I said, okay, so the features mostly line up except for where sodium is saturated. It's not saturated in potassium, that's nice. But then I was looking at that um, 144 kilometer per second feature that didn't seem to do much of anything in sodium. But in the potassium line, it seems to be disappearing. Does that mean that the material is disappearing that's doing the absorbing? Kind of, it kind of, yes, it does. So what's happening is that this spectrum <coughs> is made by um, potassium one, or what we would call non-ionized potassium, which means potassium that still has all of its electrons. Okay, so if it's close enough to a supernova, that material could become ionized over time because it's being bathed in the supernova radiation, especially the UV radiation, the ultraviolet that's coming from the supernova. Um, and that can cause potassium in particular to lose its outer electron. And once that potassium has gone from neutral, having all its electrons, to ionized and missing one, it doesn't absorb at this wavelength anymore because now the electron structure of the, those atoms has changed. Right? So we learned before that it takes um, an electron moving only in very specific energy levels to do this kind of absorption. So it's not that the material is disappearing, but it's changing. And it's changing over time on a time scale that's very similar to the supernova light curve. So what you're seeing is the black lines are earlier in time and the red lines are later in time. And that time goes over the main evolution time of the supernova itself. So this is a very difficult little observation to make. It kind of was hiding in there in the data. But it turned out to be very powerful because to say that potassium is being ionized when the sodium is not, it has to be at a fairly specific distance from the supernova. So if you have a lot of radiation, if it's being bathed in very heavy radiation and it's very close, you would see that sodium ionized and you would see a similar effect in the sodium spectrum, which we don't see. But if it's just far enough away, such that potassium, which is slightly easier uh, to ionize, um, if it's just far enough away that potassium can get ionized, but sodium can't, then you're in business. That's something, that's a model that really explains what's happening here. And so I can figure out, I use my physics and I figure out how far away that has to be. And it's about 10 to the 17, no, that was wrong. It's about 10 to the 18 or 19 centimeters. Oh wait, yeah, so we work in centimeters even though we're astronomers, which seems crazy, <laughs> but, but we do. Um, and so that actually puts it right at the edge of what we would consider circumstellar material versus just stuff that could randomly be along the line of sight. And so um, this, uh, the, oh right, so this became a paper um, claiming time-varying potassium in high-resolution spectra, which was awesome. It was the first paper I ever wrote that someone wrote a rebuttal paper to. It's really fun. That's the, <laughs> the way science works. I mean, it's a little bit maybe narcissistic because my name was in every paragraph, you know, like <laughs> as said in Graham at all, but no, it's actually this. So. Um, it was fun. They just have a different idea that the CSM didn't come from the progenitor system, but that it's actually part of a planetary nebula. So it was interesting, and it still means that um, what I observed was right, just how I interpreted could be interpreted in different ways. Um, so in these same spectra, we saw a couple of other things that we also didn't see any evolution in, but they're probably just part of the regular material in the galaxy anyway. So there's calcium, and then there's also uh, the dib lines, diffuse interstellar bands, which remain a mystery to this day, their source, even though they were discovered right here at Lick by Mary Leah Hedger in the 1920s. So I have a, a fun game. Uh, <laughs> I really like snacks, as most astronomers do, and so I made an M82 interstellar material mix. It's both a snack and a puzzle. <laughs> and the snack has pretzels, banana chips, yogurt-covered berries, and nibs of cacao. And so what you've just learned about the spectrum of supernova 2014J, what do you think each of these snacks corresponds to in terms of the circumstellar material and interstellar material? Talk with your friends, and then I'll <laughs> let you know. <laughs> They are <laughs> salty. <sausage. laughs> Very good question. 
pretzels. Get. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal. Okay. Okay. Did you get it? <laughs> yeah, the dibs are hard because it's a different kind of relation. It's more of a play on a word than a than an actual thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Colleagues in our group lunch meeting, they didn't all get it either. They were like, oh dibs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. So I like to do fun things like that sometimes. Good time. I didn't. This was months ago. I'm sorry. Didn't bring enough to share. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Actually, I have no snacks at all. But um, there's a vending machine, I think, over. <laughs> if only we could discover Cheetos in the interstellar material. <laughs> I could work it in there. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's actually 10:30 now. Where is my? Um, I think that I'm gonna just go ahead and wrap up because the next talk's gonna start now. Yeah. So. Uh, and its connection with sci-fi. So I just want to end with saying Lick Observatory is a great place to work and visit. I've had a great time of just showing the pictures of a couple of the people who work here that I most commonly interact with while I'm observing um, up here. Yeah, the cat. He's always he's like the astronomer welcoming committee. Bear the cat. Um, he's actually Eric's cat. Um, super friendly. Um, Yes, and all the great people that I work with a lot. And so thank you so much for coming and participating, for listening to my talk, and for supporting Lick Observatory. Any friend of Lick is a friend of mine. So thank you. <laughs>